So this morning we are going to attempt to wrap up um, our study. We've been going through the books of First and Second Thessalonians these last number of months. We've been unpacking a lot of, of incredible truth that Paul was uh, communicating to the church in Thessalonica. And I pray that uh, we'd all recognize that what was true for Thessalonica uh, is true for many of us, right? That as we seek to live uh, the life of Christ in a hostile world, right? The title of our series is Hope and Holiness in a Hostile World. And we saw that this young church that the Apostle Paul planted was going under, it was coming under some really difficult times because as they were living out their faith, they were being persecuted by, uh, by the leadership or the authorities around them. They lived in the city of Thessalonica, which was known for its, its pagan worship. It was all kinds of, 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 all, of idolatry. In fact, much of their income came as a result of their idolatry and all the things that they'd sell and things like that. Well, now Paul comes in, preaches the gospel, and people are getting saved, and the culture very quickly is starting to change as they're abandoning a lot of the, the paganry, paganry and the idolatry and all of the worship. And it's hitting them right in the wallets. And so they, they want to stop the move of God. And so there's persecution that starts coming upon the church, hoping that that would stop them. They, we see the hostility that's there. We see Paul um, is, is no longer in the city. They are uh, thinking that maybe if they remove Paul or, or make his credibility questionable, maybe they can stop this move of God, and uh, they're unable to do that. They circulate a letter uh, appearing to be from the Apostle Paul uh, saying that the reason that the church is going through such hostility and difficult times was because they missed the rapture. And as a result of that, they were in the last days. They were in the midst of the tribulation. And so the church, this young church, which has only been in the faith for probably months at this point, um, is really wrestling with this idea that, wow, did we miss the rapture? Are we in the midst of the tribulation? And Paul writes these two letters probably um, four to six months apart from one another with the attempt to kind of put at ease their fears that, no, you have not missed the rapture. You're not in the midst of the tribulation. In 1 Thessalonians, we see Paul will talk a lot about the rapture and the events uh, leading up to the rapture, what that's going to look like. And in 2 Thessalonians, he talks about the second coming and the events that will be leading up to that as well. And so we see that, that this is a, uh, a time of tremendous encouragement from the Apostle Paul, reminding them that, listen, even though things are difficult right now, God's got you. Don't get discouraged. God has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. And so as we come now to this last chapter in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we see now Paul's going to kind of give some final thoughts. Um, the topic around the church, obviously at this point, has a lot to do with eschatology, uh, this end times, right? The study of end times. And so Paul, in this final chapter of this second epistle, is kind of laying out some final thoughts to the church on, on how they are to uh, navigate through these difficult times. And so as we look, about, as we look at the content here, um, we see that it, it, it created one of two responses in the people. Um, obviously, there was some e uneasiness because of the, the hostility, and, the, and there was worry that was there uh, that, they, that they missed the rapture. Um, and then there was also a response of like, well, you know what? If Jesus came or is going to come at any moment, then, then why work? Why do anything? It, it, it created a lot of, of apathy and idleness, and, and Paul's going to address that because this, the church, um, they just kind of used um, the fact that Christ could come or Christ did come as an excuse for their own laziness. And as a result, they were, they were very unproductive in their community and in the church. And so Paul kind of puts them on the carpet a little bit in this letter and, and, and tells the church, here's how you need to navigate through these uncertain times. And so that's kind of like where we left off. I just figured let me bring you there so we can kind of get a better sense of what we're about to read. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul writes this in verse 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you 
and that we, may be, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Notice Paul's first appeal here is to acknowledge his need of them to pray, to pray for the situation and to pray for him. What I love about this is Paul recognizes his own limitations to accomplish what God has called him to do apart from the empowering of God the Holy Spirit. He knew that he didn't have the tools in and of himself, and so he's soliciting prayer from the church, which is the other thing we see here. We see the importance of the community of Christ. His, his, he, we see that he highlights the, the, the value of, of the community of faith. Many of you have come to that same realization at one time or another in your own lives. We've come to appreciate and seen the tremendous value Maybe you've been through a hard time. Maybe you've been at the end of your rope. Maybe you've been through circumstances or situations that were completely out of your control. And then the family of God was able to come alongside you and be a blessing to you, to be the, the extension of Jesus' love for you. I remember in 2018 when my, when my father passed away, it was a season, it was a really, it was a really hard time for me, obviously, and, and, and I, felt, I just felt very weak from that and very uh, concerned about that. I was grieving, I was, I was tired, I was, I was hurting on the inside, and, and I needed to be strong for everybody, right? And, and it just wasn't there. And unlike I've never experienced before, this body of Christ came alongside me and my family and it was like Jesus carried us through you in that difficult time. And that's what the body of Christ is intended to be. And, and, what Paul, and so what we see here in Paul is this, this awareness of Paul saying, hey, listen, I don't got it all together either. I'm going through seven difficult times. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? He asks them to pray, pray in two different areas. The first area that he has to pray, he says, pray that the word of the Lord may, spree, may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. I like that. Paul recognizes that if this move of God that they were experiencing in Thessalonica was going to continue, it wasn't going to be from a program. It wasn't going to become from some strategy or, or, or some ability of any person. If, there, if this was going to continue, it was going to continue by the word of the Lord speeding ahead, spreading ahead, because it's the word of God that changes things. And he said, pray that the Lord, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead, and I love this, and be honored. That it may be obeyed, that it may be revered, that it may be valued. And he says, as has happened among you. Because again, this church was only six to eight months years old. It was a, it was a baby church. And yet, they were having such impact in their community. There was such growth going on to the church. The word of the Lord was, was spreading quickly through the church. It was changing the culture. And so Paul's prayer is like, man, just keep praying that God continues to do that very thing. And the second thing he asked them to pray for is pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Paul knew what it was to be on, 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 at the tip of the spear. He knew, he knew what it was. Again, much of the lies and the rumors that were being spread around were being characterized as if it was coming from the Apostle Paul through this forged letter. And so Paul's appeal to them is, hey, would you pray for me that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men? Not delivered just in, in physical presence, but you know what? What really gets difficult is what takes place in the mind. Right, that the influence of these evil men, right, the lies of the evil men, the assault and the attack, of the, that it would not influence us. Paul's like, would you pray for us? Would you pray for us? I mean, Paul's not being desperate here. He's just being very self-aware. See, Paul's confidence was not in himself. And that's why he unapologetically appealed to them, would you pray? And would you pray for me? And would you pray for the ministry? He knew that his confidence was, was in the Lord, as we see in verse three. 
He says, look, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. His confidence was in what the Lord would do through them. I like that, that in addition to asking for prayer for himself, he kind of gives him a peek behind the curtain and lets them know, and, and here's what I'm praying for you. Right, pray for me, but and here's what I'm praying for you. My prayer is that the Lord would direct their hearts in the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. I like that. Here's what I'm praying for you, that your hearts would be directed to the love of God. What a great prayer that each and every one of us ought to pray for ourselves. That they wouldn't be directed by their fears. That they wouldn't be influenced by their worries, by their emotions, by, the, by many of the, the deceptive influences that they were engaging in. And now let's get our eyes off of they and let's look at ourselves that we would not be influenced by our fears, that we would not be influenced by our worries, by our history, by, by, the, the, by the deceptive influences around us, but instead that we would be directed in the love of God. That's our heart's desire. Quite literally, literally that we would walk in step with the Spirit and be directed by the love of God. That's what Paul was praying for them. And notice he says this, then he says, look, and the steadfastness of Christ. That you would be directed by the love of God and also by the steadfastness of Christ. Not just steadfastness, but the steadfastness of Christ. In other words, this, the same unwavering commitment with which Jesus was faithful to his mission, so too his prayer for them is that they too would remain faithful and unwavering in their commitment, that they would follow the example and the influence of Jesus, that the same steadfastness that Jesus had in his ministry would be experienced and lived out in their lives. That ought to be the prayer for every one of our hearts today. That we would be steadfast, in our faith, that the same steadfastness that Christ modeled would be evidenced in our lives. I mean, this is where it hit home, hits home, folks. This is where the biblical from the past, the truth from the past, needs to be applied to today because it does not change, right? It needs to run parallel with the practical outworking of our lives today. Steadfastness needs to be the mark of everyone who considers themselves disciples of Jesus Christ. That we'd be committed, that we would be unwavering, that we would be consistent in living our lives out so that all the world would see who is the most influential person in our lives. That being the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of the cost. And sometimes it's hard to remain steadfast. Sometimes it's hard to, to be consistent. Sometimes it's hard going against the flow. Have you found yourself going against the flow of culture a lot these days? Have you found yourself feeling like, hey, am I the only one who thinks this way, feels this way, sees things this way? That's why it's good to be amongst God's people who are holding on to truth. You start to realize, all right, you know what? There's still 7,000 who haven't bowed their knee to bow, right? It's important that we remain steadfast in our faith. That was Paul's prayer for them directly and indirectly. Obviously, this passage of Scripture was preserved for us to apply to our lives as well. Look what Paul says in verse six. He says, now we command you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness. Now he's gonna deal with some of the issues. Again, this is his last, is like his last hurrah, last chapter, last epistle. He's sending, he's gonna drop the bomb. He's gonna have the, he's gonna have the talk, 
right? And so he says to him, here's what we say, keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you've received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we may not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, Paul says, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Isn't that a great word? Wouldn't you love to broadcast that all over the culture today? Right? I mean, Jesus said, the word of God says, if you're not willing, listen, if you can't work, I mean, obviously if there's something going on in your life that prevents you from working physically, obviously that's not the case. This is the, we're dealing with the issue of laziness. Right? And he says, if you don't work, you should not eat. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we did not, were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden for you. It was not because we did not have the right. Look at verse 10. For even when we were with you, we, get, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness. Look, not busy at work, but busybodies. I like that. Not so, now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. There's a lot going on in that passage. And, and we addressed some of this earlier on because he, he alluded to it also in, in 1 Thessalonians. How many of you in your, in your Bible that you're reading um, titles this section of Scripture, The Warning Against Idleness? Does anybody have that on there? The Warning Against Idleness. Um, let me just let you know that the, the, the headings, the titles in the Scripture are not inspired. Um, they, they are not, matter of fact, the, the chapters and the verses are not inspired. Those were pl placed in there years later to help people kind of navigate around there. So while your title might say warning against idleness, because it's not inspired, I'm going to take a little liberty and maybe change that a little bit because I don't think that this passage of uh, this section of scripture isn't so much a warning against idleness as much as it is a, as a warning against bad influences. Bad influences. Let me explain why I feel that way. In the first section, we see that Paul prayed that they would not be influenced by evil men, but instead that they would be influenced by what? By the love of God, and they'd be influenced by the steadfastness that they saw in Jesus Christ, right? So they wouldn't be influenced by the wicked, evil men, but instead they would be influenced by the, the love of God, and they would be influenced by the steadfastness that they saw in Jesus Christ, their example. Now he moves into this next section, and he opens up with an appeal to keep away from any brother walking in idleness. See, so why, would, why would you say that, Paul? so that you wouldn't be influenced by their ways. Stay away from that brother so he's not going to influence your ways. In fact, what Paul does is he goes right from there, says, before you're influenced by that, he boldly states, here, you ready? He says, imitate me. Let me be an example. Hey, when I was with you, I wasn't idle. I worked night and day. I paid for my own bread. I didn't expect anybody to give me anything. There was no handouts. I worked night and day. It was completely my right to not have to work amongst you. But I chose to be an example for you so that you would know what it looks like to work hard in your ministry. And so Paul's like, hey, listen, don't be influenced by those who are idle but you know what? Look at me. Let me be an example. You see, this section is about who and what we allow to influence us. And that truth from the pages of the past carries right up until our very day today, doesn't it? Everything in our culture is driven by influence. Social media is the most powerful influence in the world today. 
It could be a wonderful tool, but it could also be an incredible distraction. It is there ultimately to influence people. It tells you what to think. It tells you how to feel. It tells you what you need to look like. It tells you what to value. It tells you what to believe, right? You say, I, it doesn't, I don't really hear them say that. Oh, no, no, look what they celebrate. Look what they promote. Look what they flood your way every single time, every page that gets, that gets promoted before you. They're influencing you. That's not all bad. We just, we just need to know when to turn it off and when to, so what do we need to do? We need to make sure that the social media influence isn't, isn't having more influence on us than the truth of God's word. Because you, you, if, you're, if you're allowing the truth of God's word to influence you, you'll be able to spot those untruths, those lies that come, that try to influence you away from Christ. Because remember, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And he's there to get our eyes off of Christ, right? As Christians, we need to be very careful to properly steward what and who we allow to inform and influence us. Don't get so caught up in social media, folks. It blows my mind some of the things I see people post. Just, just saying, hey, if you want to make me your friend, that's fine, but don't think for one second. I have discovered a lot of things about people just by what they post. <laughs> and I'm not the one you got to worry about. Hello? <laughs> Jesus he might not be a friend on your Facebook account, but I tell you what, he sees what you write. He sees what you're posting on Instagram. And we need to make sure that what we're putting out there is something we can be proud of if we stand, when we stand before Jesus. We need to make sure our cyber presence is consistent with our spiritual identity. Right? Everybody said, ouch. Everybody's looking and going, has he been watching my feed? I, you'd be surprised at what I watch. I turn it off a lot of times. <laughs> but look what he says in verse 13. He says, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not grow weary in doing good. Can I just say that Paul is pointing out a reality that every Christian at one time or another faces? Sometimes it gets tiring doing the right thing. Sometimes it's hard and tiring to do the, the right thing when it's the, the long way to do it. Sometimes it's hard to be truthful all the time. Sometimes it's hard to be loving all the time, forgiving all the time, gracious all the time. Hello? It's hard knowing that saying the right thing even in the right way, might cost you. It gets tiring. It's the right thing to do, but how do you know it gets tiring? Standing up for truth will cost you something. And this, and this church in Thessalonica, again, this, this young church, they're, they're, they're making an impact in their, in their community, but the reality of it is a lot of the relationships they, they stood with, and, hey, they partied with them, right? They worshiped with them in pagan, pagan idolatry. They were hanging with them. All of a sudden, they come to Christ, their life changes. And it gets different. And Paul's reminding them, listen, man, just don't be influenced by them. And don't get weary in doing good. Paul encouraged the churches in Galatia with those same words in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. He says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Hey, listen, giving up might not be an option for you. Uh, giving up, thank God by his grace, has never been an option in my life where I'm like, like, I'm like Peter, like, where am I going to go? But I know what it is to be weary. I know what it is to be discouraged, depressed. Don't be weary in doing good. Both of these verses in Galatians and Thessalonians, and, and Thessalonians they emphasize the importance of, of perseverance and not growing weary in doing good. 
These verses remind believers of the importance of, of remaining steadfast in their, in their commitment to living out their faith, even in the face of challenges and discouragement. They encourage believers to continue doing good, knowing that there will be a day where we stand before him. And the things that discouraged us today and held us back today will be no more. And we'll stand before the one who we did it all for. And we'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Don't be weary in well-doing. In, in well it's, it's an appeal to trust God with the outcomes while remaining faithful in the process. Look at verse 14. He says, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Those are some hard words right there. Some pretty hard words from the Apostle Paul. Some would even say, wow, Paul, that's really mean. That's not very tolerant. That's not very gracious. However, it only highlights the power of influence and the need to guard who you allow to influence you. Look what he says, have nothing to do with them. Have nothing to do with them. It doesn't mean you cancel them. Let's put this in proper perspective here. Let's look, see, when you come across, just a good thing to do in Bible study, really important. When you come across a scripture like this that makes your eyebrows go, what? Make sure you look at that through the lens of everything else the scripture has to say on the subject. Right? Because the reality of it is, if this is all we knew on the subject, we'd be really alone, very, <laughs> alone a lot. Right? You'd be avoiding a lot of people or they'd be avoiding you. So what, what, is, this, what is this saying? I mean, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. What does he say? He's not saying, don't, don't cancel them. Right, that's what our culture does. That's what happens in the church. Don't, don't look at them like, like, you're dead to me. That's not how, show me where Jesus ever did that. He didn't even do that with the Pharisees. It means you don't let them influence you. It means you allow the influence you receive from God to be the influence that that person receives from you. It also means that you don't give that person the impression that everything's okay. You know, too many times we, we as, a, um, as an attempt to win somebody back in their sinful lifestyle, we don't point, we don't point out the fact that they're living a sinful lifestyle. We want them to feel okay in our presence. We want them to feel loved and welcomed and wanted and everything else. That's not what, what the scripture calls us to do. Notice what he says here. Have nothing to do with them that they may be ashamed. The reality of it is that someone who's living in habitual sin should not feel so comfortable in your presence, the saint of God. Not that you're condemning them. Not that you're judging them. But that you are lovingly pointing out and dealing with them, as we'll look at in a moment, as a brother, as a sister, who you want to see spared from the consequences of their sinful actions. Is that a cricket I heard? <laughs> like it says, don't regard him or her as an enemy. I met with a pastor recently that has been on, um, has just been a real divisive character in our denomination. And um, we've had to deal with him on many, many levels. And um, uh, we ended up having to suspend his ordination. And it was a hard, hard, hard thing. And um, after the process, I had gone up and I talked to him and, and just to see how he was doing. And finally, he said to me, I'm surprised you're willing to talk to me. And I said, listen, you're not my enemy, you're my brother. You're a brother who's caught in a trespass. And I fear for you that the consequences of your decisions are gonna carry out and be far greater than you ever expected. 
And I hate to see that be your reality. You see, we don't treat them as enemies because I was under, partly because of my role in the, in the denomination, I was under direct attack from him. And I was like, you know what? You're not attacking me. You're my brother. You're caught in a trespass. And I pray to God that you repent of your sin. You don't regard them as enemy, but warn him as a brother. Warn him as a brother. It's a beautiful contrast that we see here. This word warn is, isn't the best English translation of the Greek word. Because warn him as a brother sounds so harsh and strong and, and negative. The Greek word that's here, nuthateo, it literally means not warn in a, in, in, in a harsh way, but instead it means to admonish. It means to advise. It means to instruct and, and give direction, not to cancel them out, not to, you're dead to me. No, it means to go after your brother, go after your sister, to encourage them, advise them, to counsel them, to win them to truth. Don't treat them as an enemy, enemy but warn them as a brother. Let the content of your interaction be instructive. Don't write them off as, as dead to you. Now, while Paul, as I mentioned before, is primarily speaking about influence in this passage, passage of Scripture, Paul is condemning idleness, which is consistent with what Jesus taught as well, especially in light of awaiting his return. This is what's going on in the church. Again, the, the, the topic of conversation in Thessalonica was the end time, the coming of Jesus, right? And so what it created in a lot of them was a lot of idleness. They pulled back. They weren't participating. They, were just, they weren't working. They were absorbing, right? And Jesus addresses this same subject in Matthew chapter 24 and 25 on how we are supposed to respond at the time or prior to his coming. And it is, it, is, it is definitely not idleness. I'm not gonna encourage you to, to go there. You can just write down the passages. But in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is teaching about the end times. It's that period right before the second coming. And in Matthew chapter 24, he speaks of the destruction of the temple. He speaks of the signs of the end of the age. He speaks of the abomination of desolation. He speaks of the coming of the Son of Man. And he points out the fact that nobody will know the day or the hour in which he'll return, right? So, I mean, he's dropping the bomb in Matthew chapter 24, and he's laying out for them what's going to happen, what's going what's to look like leading up to that moment where he returns to the earth with the church. Now, as you get into chapter 25, same flow of, again, as I said before, the chapters aren't inspired, or inspired. So we see the same flow of thought. Jesus just gets done laying that out there. He presents two parables to them. A parable is a fictitious, a fictitious story offered to present a biblical truth. That was the way in which Jesus oftentimes taught. Jesus was a, a master storyteller. And oftentimes what Jesus would do is he would take a truth and he would, he would present a fictitious story, a parable, parable to highlight a, a spiritual truth. And so he just gets done laying out what it's going to be like right before the coming of the Son of Man. And then he kind of PSs that with, with these two parables to help them understand where their heads should be. And he gives these two, these two parables in Matthew chapter 25. He talks about the 10 virgins, and then he talks about the talents. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I encourage you to go back there and you read it for yourself. But the parable of the 10 virgins tells the story of five wise and five foolish virgins waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. The wise, the wise ones brought extra oil for their lamps, while the foolish ones did not. When the bridegroom came, the wise virgins were prepared. But the foolish ones who were not prepared missed out because they weren't ready. Jesus is telling, tells this story right after he lays out all the end times. What is he saying here? The message is clear. It speaks of the readiness and the mindset of the believers as they await the return of Christ. Jesus is laying out for them and for us what our mindset ought to be, that at any moment Christ can return. He's talking about what our mindset ought to be as we await, the, and how our, how, our mind net, how our mindset communicates our awareness of his coming. That's what this parable does. Our mindset communicates our awareness of his coming. The second parable 
has to do with what believers are to do while they're waiting. First has to do with their mindset, now it has to do with what they do while they're waiting. And toward that end, Jesus tells the parable of the, of the talents. Jesus tells, a, tells of a master who entrusts three of his servants with different amounts of money, or talents is the, script, the word that the scripture uses. He entrusts them with three different amounts of money before he goes on a journey. Two of the servants invest, and do, invest the money and they double their money. The foolish servant buries his money, does not invest any of the money, and he hides the talent. Upon the master's return, he rewards the faithful servants and he punishes the unfaithful one. Jesus is teaching the importance of, of using our gifts and our resources wisely as we await his coming. You see, what Jesus is doing here is the same thing that Paul is saying in, in First and Second Thessalonians about not being idle. Jesus is, get, just gets done talking about all the events that are gonna lead to his, his coming and he says, here's what you ought to do. Here's what we ought to do. Our mindset ought to be one of readiness, not getting distracted by the cares and, and, uh, and, and, and the distractions of the world. In addition to that, we need to recognize that our talents, our money, our resources need to communicate our awareness that Christ could come at any moment. Interesting, he talks about their mindset and their money as the way in which they communicate their awareness that Christ can come at any moment. And so what Jesus is saying is, be busy. This idea of talents, is, it's more than just money. It's about their time. It's about their resources. It's about their treasure. It's about what they do with God, with what God has put into their lives. It's about being busy while we wait his coming. These parables warn against the same idleness that was taking place among the believers in Thessalonica. So what, what's the big idea of what, what Jesus was saying and what Paul is saying to the church in Thessalonica and to you and I? That at any moment, Christ can come. And we as his people need to be ready for that moment. But while we are ready, we need to be busy doing God's work on the earth. That we are not to pause and become lazy and distracted by the cares of the world. But we are to live lives that look like somebody who is waiting for their master to come at any moment. Live as, as if you were about to stand before Jesus with your next breath. Because at some moment, every one of us will. Whether it's by way of a hole in the ground or a hole in the sky, every one of us are gonna breathe our last moment and be in the presence of Jesus. And we want to live our lives. That's what Paul is saying to them. Live your life to the glory and honor of God. I remember when I was high school, I played football, and I remember our coach used to rally us together before the game and get us in the big huddle, and, and, and he'd say a couple things to us, but he'd always say the same things. He'd say, listen, tighten up your chin straps because you're going to be in for a ride. And sometimes we really were, and we knew just what that meant. But then he'd always say this, Leave it all on the field. Don't save anything for anything. Leave everything you got on the field. And you know, likewise, that's how we ought to live our lives in Christ. That's how we ought to live our life here. Buckle up your chin strap. And man, let's leave it all on the field for Jesus. Let's leave it all on the field. Let's give everything we've got. Investing all of our time, our talents, and our treasures for the kingdom and the glory of God. Paul concludes this epistle with this final benediction. Verse 16, he says, Now may the, the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Isn't that beautiful? May the Lord of peace himself give you peace, look, at all times and in every way. God knows what we need, when we need it, and how much we need it. In other words, coming at you from every direction at all times and in every way. He says, the Lord be with you all. And then he says, I, Paul, I write this greeting with my own hand. Again, he's addressing that forgery. This is the sign of the genuineness of every letter of mine. It is the way that I write. And he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you 
all. May these two short epistles remind us of the hope that we have in Christ and may it drive us to live the life of Christ on this earth by the grace of God and to the, to the glory of God. Now, I know I only scratch the surface of all that these epistles teach us. But I pray that the lessons we talked about would inspire us to passionately follow Jesus and that we'd leave it all in the field to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it changes not. I pray, Lord, that as we have journeyed through these epistles together, I pray that we live these things out in a way that's pleasing to you. That we'd be comforted by the fact that you know where we're at. You know what we need. That we would be reminded that we're people on mission. And Lord, I pray that we'd be faithful to that. But I pray most of all that as we, for as many days as we have left on this earth, I pray that we would be more and more like Jesus. For in him we live and move and have our being. We thank you for these words that you've preserved for us through the ages. We ask, Lord, that you be glorified in our lives by way in which we respond to him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.